Water, water everywhere, and it's still punishing our countryside. Welcome to the show. Now, after the wettest ever winter in England and a February which saw three times usual rainfall in some places, March is shaping up pretty damp as well. What does that mean for those that make a living from the countryside and creatures that live here? Also on the programme... As the grid sets out plans for thousands of miles of new pylons and cables, is Labour's accelerated zero-carbon electricity strategy realistic? Cheaper Chinese electric vehicles are bringing down the cost of owning an EV, but will they undercut European companies? And with sewage still high on the agenda, we look at how it's now spilling over onto the silver screen. So let's find out what this really wet winter means for our farming, our nature and our water supplies. For many days and nights this winter, the heavens opened and drenched the land beneath. Not least here in Oxfordshire, where the Thames is racing to shift all that water. What are we coming into here? So this is Ifley Meadows. This is one of the Wildlife Trust's floodplain meadows. So uh -huh. we're used to it flooding, but this year has been exceptionally wet. This water meadow is meant to flood in winter and some species thrive underwater. Certainly some of the plants here love it really wet. They have special adaptations, little snorkels, so that they can actually breathe when it's, they're underwater. Like what? Uh, so on their leaves or their stems they have little holes that will take their plants above the water level so that they can take oxygen down to their roots. But if it goes on too long, parts of the food chain can suffer. Things like small mammals don't do so well when it's underwater because obviously they they haven't got anywhere to go, so they either have to climb up trees or bramble bushes to survive, but a lot of them will just simply drown. And then that has a knock-on impact for other species, such as barn owls later on in the year, which rely on those small mammal populations. Scientists say climate change will likely mean our winters get wetter and warmer. So our recent experience will move from exceptional to expected. A warmer global atmosphere can hold more moisture. Typically, for every one degree rise in temperature, you'd expect about 7% extra moisture in the air. That leads to more frequent downpours. It leads to more intense downpours. But excess water doesn't just sit around or flow off the surface. It drains down into rocks. And especially in southern England, many of these are porous, meaning they can act like a giant sponge. This pipe leads to that sponge. So what have we here? Well, it's an observation borehole. It right. lets us look down under the ground and measure the water level in okay. the aquifer. Let's have a look. OK. <laughs> right. So here we are. Oh, I can see some water level right there. Mm -hmm. So I can use this to measure how deep it is. But normally you'd use this because it would be much further beneath the ground, would it? Yeah, this one's got 30 metres of cable on right. it and we might easily have the water 30 metres below ground. Okay. It's only that deep. And under normal circumstances, you'd need that beep because it would be many metres down and you it, wouldn't know, wouldn't it, be able to see when it, it hit the surface. It would be so far below right. that you wouldn't have any sight yeah. of it at all. And often we have so, nice plenty of water in the bank. Does that secure our supplies into the future? Well, it's positive because the aquifers store a lot of water that actually sustain rivers in the summer. And the wet weather we've had over this winter has been good for aquifers, it's restored a lot of the storage. And that goes for our reservoirs as well. The reservoirs are healthy at the end of February. We saw that they were um, over 95% capacity, which is close to average for this time of year. And in fact, they've been um, replenished since, since they were very low after the 2022 drought through that autumn and, and winter. Um, and so they're, they're now in a, in a healthy state. But our food supply depends on what happens above ground. Uh, the clay down in the bottom is still marsh-like. And farmer by day, Groove Armada DJ by night, Andy Cato has had a punishing winter. People who did drill crops in the winter, they've been flooded. Uh, a lot of people couldn't drill it at all. I didn't manage to drill any. Uh, we're now 
rolling all that through into spring, but for the people who drilled crops and lost them, it's a whole new set of seed. Everyone's drilling spring seed, so the price of spring seed costs an absolute fortune. And then here we are, you know, mid-March, and, and it's still absolutely saturated. So it's just from a business that was on wafer-thin margins to start with, it's incredibly challenging. He thinks changing weather patterns are a real threat to farming as we know it. Agriculture has been uh, has revolved around a, a stable climate and so if we go from these obviously there are variations but basically predictable framework to blocks of rain followed by blocks of, uh, of drought it's very very hard to keep the show on the road and really the only thing we can do is try and build more resilient soils. Andy runs a group of regenerative farmers known as Wild Farmed. He thinks the key to making agriculture climate change ready lies in the soil. So we take two samples, one from a cultivated field and one from the wild margin, and then compare them. This is what's going to allow heavy rain to get in quick and not go down the road and flood someone's house. And then when the drought inevitably comes, which these days it inevitably will, the same connectivity will allow the water to come back up through the soil and keep the crops going. I suppose the other question is, farm, farming generally people think is all about food, it's about other things too, but at core it's about food. Can you produce as much food with a soil like this that's also good in terms of flooding as you can with this, that a, a soil that's been worked hard? Yeah, well, you can only produce food with resilience. And so when we think about yield, we need to think about yield over time. And as we go towards extremes of weather of heavy rainfall and droughts, there is no food without soil like this. If we can't infiltrate water and hang on to it, there will be no food. So this whole idea that it's nature or food is a completely false question. We can only have one with the other. For farming and our countryside in general, the wet and warm weather brought by climate change is a clear and present danger, not simply a future threat. Adaptation is key to avoid going under. Now, Labour has committed to implementing the so-called boiler tax if elected after the government delayed it for a year following an industry backlash. The clean heat market mechanism is designed to encourage boiler manufacturers to produce an increasing amount of heat pumps relative to the gas boilers they make. If the ratio doesn't keep up with what's required, fines are imposed. It's designed to stimulate the market for heat pumps, which run on electricity, but the industry has called it a boiler tax and campaigned for it to be dropped. In a speech this week, Shadow Climate Secretary Ed Miliband recommitted himself to the policy and even revealed that he's having a heat pump installed himself. You've got a Daily Mail exclusive here. I'm currently having a heat pump installed. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking at the Green Alliance pressure group, Ed Miliband sought to draw clear water between Labour and the Conservatives on net zero ahead of the election. The election we're going to have uh, probably this year um, uh, on, is the most important election on climate and energy uh, that this country has ever seen. Families across the country are united in their desire for good jobs, lower bills, cleaner water and a green and pleasant home we can leave for our children. But instead of embracing this mainstream majority, Rishi Sunak is willing to give up the fight for lower bills and energy security because he wants to stoke the fires of a culture war. And another thing committed to by Ed Miliband this week was a completely clean grid by 2030, and that's five years ahead of the Conservative plan. But the scale of that challenge was laid out by the National Grid ESO, the company that runs Britain's electricity network. It says it needs £60 billion of upgrades to hit that 2035 target, consisting of some 4,000 miles of undersea cables and 1,000 miles of additional pylons. That's because the grid needs rewiring for renewables, with a large amount of Britain's renewable energy coming from massive offshore wind farms in the North Sea and Scotland, rather than from large power stations in the centre of England. Well, joining me to discuss all this is Claire Dichter, who is ESO National Grid Policy and Strategy Director. Uh, Claire, first of all, I mean, that ambition of Labour to bring this whole thing five years earlier, is it possible? This report that we've uh, published this week, which talks about the infrastructure that's needed and to be delivered for the 2030s, 
means that we'll have um, about 86 gigawatts of wind in total, which is a, a world-leading figure in terms of the deployment of offshore wind. So sure, I, I get that, and you know it's an ambitious target even for 2035. And I, I understand why you'd put it in for current government policy. I'm just really asking, what are the challenges if you need to bring it forward to 2030? It is a difficult um, transition to make, but we are well on the way um, in terms of making that transition to um, decarbonised uh, power, decarbonised energy system. You know, it, it is difficult enough to reach 2035, so I'm just wondering what you'd need to reach 2030. Is it you're making demands from government that they're, I don't know, tough with, with people when it comes to pylons? You know, what, what, what does it need to make it go even faster? It's mostly around shortening the planning regime. So things like our plan that we've published that give a clear national strategic plan of the infrastructure that's required is a good step towards that because it gives a good starting point that then you can carry on with the detailed plans and get that infrastructure built quicker to connect up all of that offshore wind. I've heard about 4,000 miles of offshore uh, cable. Where, What kind of areas will they run in? Is that is it around the country? Is it just from the turbines inland? The plan that we've um, published this week uh, introduces a high-level plan for a new spine that goes from Peterhead down to Merseyside and some offshore cabling that, uh, that we refer to as bootstraps because if you look at them on the map, they're lines that go under the sea generally from Scotland down to southern parts of the country. And are these running out to the, to the big current and future offshore wind farms or are they sort of running around the country like uh, people have talked about a ring main? It's almost like the channel tunnel for the chains right. so they're power lines that run under the sea that connect Scotland down to the um, southern parts of the uh, country and allow power to flow over them rather than taking it overland um, onshore. But there are some onshore ones. Are you preparing for a thousand kilometres of protest? Oh, it's the it's the role of the network operators to do that next um, stage of detail planning to make sure that they get um, the the right location that takes account of the cost, the environmental impact, the community impact, and lots of other things. Now. I speak to um, a lot of renewable energy generators and perhaps more importantly in this case potential renewable energy generators who are always complaining to me about the difficulty of getting on the grid. Is it going to help with those? So at the, at the high voltage level, which is uh, the big motorways of the electricity network that we deal with, over 60% of the projects that are waiting to connect are waiting because the, the supporting infrastructure is needed. So plans like this and delivering Forgive me, them, what does the supporting infrastructure mean? So, so the pylons, the pylons, right. the lines, the cables. Right. Um, delivering that infrastructure is what will get those projects connected onto the grid. We're off to a break now, but when we come back, we'll be looking at whether Chinese electric cars could be a threat to European manufacturers and also at a folk horror movie about sewage. Well, this, like most weeks, has been a busy one in climate and environment. And to discuss some of that, I'm joined by Sky's science correspondent, Thomas Moore. Thomas, you've been in the River Test, beautiful chalk stream, not looking so good when you were there. Absolutely not. So this is a, a river that flows through Wiltshire and, and Hampshire, one of less than 200 chalk streams around the world, one of the rarest habitats on the planet and heavily protected. And yet, southern water is discharging a huge amount of sewage, raw, untreated sewage, directly into this environment. And that is because their pipes have been overwhelmed by the sheer amount of rain that we've had over recent months. It, it, the groundwater is so high, it's actually pushing through the cracks in the sewers and flooding through. And this, the sewage plants are overwhelmed, so they're discharging it straight into this pure water. And what did you actually get to see of this person? So <laughs> that is having a, a terrible effect on the whole ecosystem. We filmed people who are, are doing what they call a kick sample. They were taking a, a sample of the, the riverbed from the, the sewage stream and then compared that to clean water just the other side of the river and the big difference in the number of invertebrates the bugs the creepy crawlies that are the food uh, for all the yeah, fish that the live food there, chain, yeah. much less in the sewage and that is a big concern as you mentioned this is to do with groundwater which is to do with our exceptionally heavy rain this winter and there was some data out uh, this week as well about the sort of global picture when it comes to weather so this is from the world meteorological organization they have a, a state of the global climate uh, and they looked at last year and once again we're seeing extreme 
uh, weather patterns around the world. But a number of records were broken. So the highest air temperature, the highest sea temperature, 90% of uh, the ocean had a marine heat wave at some point during, during the year, which is extraordinary and uh, terrible news for the coral reefs, which are the nurseries for so much ocean life. But then there was the, the, the very low Antarctic ice. You had um, uh, rapid glacier loss. You had sea level rise. All those rec records being shattered. And it's very rare for all those to tumble in one year. And a little kick in the tail in case people didn't care about climate change. It's now thought to be affecting the price of Easter eggs. Yeah, the end of the world. Indeed. <laughs> so in what way does yeah. climate change affect well, the price of gorging at Easter time? In, in many ways it shows those climate extremes we've been talking about because it affects West Africa, uh, Ivory Coast and Ghana produce an awful lot of uh, chocolate, the cocoa beans. Now they had, in December, they had uh, a, a, a twice as much rainfall and in, in February they had a, a, a drought uh, and the combination meant that they, they didn't produce anywhere near the number of cocoa beans. So uh, I, I think it's now 11 times, wait for wait, 11 times the price of oil. So you can just see how this is going to have a big impact on chocolate. Yeah, and, and, and joking apart, this is what people are saying is a sort of bellwether for what might happen with a lot of our crops from around the world. They become much less predictable. With climate change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of the really important important staple crops like uh, rice, uh, bananas. These are the crops that people depend on for uh, their basic foodstuffs. And often it is, of course, the people who are the poorest who will suffer the most. Chocolate, we can live without uh, uh, perhaps quite so many Easter eggs. But if you're trying to put food on the table and that's making it harder and more expensive because of climate change, you can see why this really matters. Now, in the world of cars, as in so many manufactured goods, the Chinese are taking the world by storm, and this is their latest model, the BYD, stands for Build Your Dreams. And to discuss it, I'm joined by Steve Fowler, who's editor-in-chief of Auto Express. What is the significance of this particular model, Steve? Well, this is only the third BYD model that's been launched in the UK in a little over a year, and already this car is shortlisted as World Car of the Year. So, in theory, it's one of the best three cars to have been launched over the past 12 months. Well, should we find out what I, whether I like it or not? Let's go for a drive. Right. Why is this car considered good? Why is it in contention? Yeah, it stacks up well. It's, it's good to drive. It's reasonably efficient. It's got a good range, like all electric cars. It's quite quick, so it's fun to drive. But also, look around you inside. It's, it's made really nicely. It's a really attractive car to look at on the outside and to be in on the inside. Uh, yeah, quality is, is really good, not what you might expect from, uh, from a Chinese brand. And there's also a piastre resistance if I say, hey, BYD, rotate screen. OK, rotating the screen. <laughs> Not that the world needs a rotating screen, but it's kind of fun, isn't it? <laughs> it is indeed. It made me chuckle. Now, the big story here, though, is whether the Chinese makers are a threat to the European makers when it comes to electric cars, and are they an unfair threat? Where well, are we? On? Well, that's a really good question, because we know at the moment the EU is uh, investigating that. They're looking at potentially putting tariffs on uh, Chinese electric cars or Chinese-made electric cars coming into to Europe. That may well follow into the UK as well. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a good question that I've asked a lot of the execs in the auto industry. The general consensus from them is, as long as it's a free and fair market, then bring it on. They like competition. As one exec told me last week, it drives us quicker and it makes us better. And from a consumer point of view, choice is good. So how much is this one? This is quite a luxury model. Yeah, this is a, a top-end BYD seal. So this is going to cost you over £50,000. The range starts at £45,000. We're yet to see really cheap Chinese cars come to the UK. There's talk of them, but they're not here yet. So the ones that are out there, the cheapest around the world for Chinese cars? Well, last year at the Shanghai Auto Show, BYD revealed the BYD Seagull, part of its ocean series like this, this seal. That was around $11,000. How are the Chinese keeping some of their electric cars so cheap? Well, the big concern in terms of competition is that some of the Chinese car makers are being subsidised by the Chinese government. Now, clearly, that's not something that's going to happen in, uh, in, in Europe and elsewhere in the world. So that's unfair competition, and that's why the EU is looking at imposing tariffs. What do you think these uh, Chinese arrivals mean overall for the buyers of electric cars? Well, ultimately, it's good news for, uh, for electric car buyers because they're getting more choice and hopefully it's going to drive price down. And we know one of the three biggest barriers to entry in the electric car space and why people aren't really getting excited about them 
is the price compared to an internal combustion engine car. They all seem to be so much more expensive, particularly because there are no incentives in the UK. Now, as we heard earlier, sewage pollution in our rivers continues to be a huge problem, but now one that's spilling onto the silver screen. It may be premiering in the buzzing urban borough of Brixton, South London, but environmental folk horror Black Samphire has a much more natural theme at its heart. Sorry. Look. Samphire. Filmed in West Sussex, the modern-day monster it portrays is water pollution and its suffocating effect on Britain's rivers. It's a message the filmmakers behind the project say they had to get out. Our world faces so many huge, complex, intangible problems out there. And what Silicon Gothic does is we take those problems and monstify them to so make them physical and understandable. As rivers around the country are polluted by sewage, caused in part by a changing climate and extreme weather patterns, the film offers a timely message. It's not something that's really obvious when you look at a river and you, you don't really see what's sort of lurking under the surface. Um, so to make something like that tangible and like a threat was really important with the story. And the production's eco-credentials ran deeper than just its subject, with two beach cleans during pre-production to help raise funds and a strict sustainability policy practised throughout the shoot. Green Rider was really refreshing to me, I think, because it's really small, simple, actionable changes. And I think from an individual and like an actor's perspective, it's something that we can bring onto all other sets moving forward. I know on like bigger productions, there's conversations about trailer sizes and things that re really don't matter, but you can make little changes. And it feels quite good as an actress to be able to have control over the variables. A micro-budget film with big ambitions, it hopes to both set an example to larger studios while laying bare the plight of our precious river habitats. The equivalent of more than 1,270 years of raw sewage have been dumped into Britain's rivers, lakes and seas since 2016, according to Environment Agency data. But despite hitting headlines, water companies and regulators seem slow to take action. Campaigning group River Action UK, who partnered with the production, hope those in charge will now sit up and take note. It's going to tell a very powerful story, one that's going to be really hard to ignore if you're a politician, if you're a polluter, or if you're a member of the public. Hopefully this will really get into the heart of what's going on in this world. But with decades of underinvestment in sewage and water systems, it's an issue no one seems quite ready to deal with head on. But you do understand that deadlines just tend to write themselves. With the clock ticking as dirty water is pumped into seas and rivers, this green tale about dark forces strives to highlight the potential horror story flowing through our waterways and the consequences of ignoring the signs. Bethany Minnell, Sky News. That's it for this week. Remember, you can catch up on all your climate and environment news on the Sky News website and app or by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. And that is it for The Climate Show. This is our final outing. A huge thank you to the amazing people who've given their time and their wisdom to appear on the show, the great production team behind the lens, small but perfectly formed, and most of all, to you for watching. Take care of this small blue dot. Goodbye. <laughs>